Good morning. You sound like I sounded when I was in chapel, like I'm like not going to have a class before chapel because I'm borderline allergic to mornings. So good morning, and I'm so excited to be here. Like Bob said, I'm a Gordon grad, and I'm super happy to be back. I always feel a little nervous following Bob's introductions because he says really nice things, and then I'm like, now I got to live up to that. Here we are. So we're talking about love this semester. And love is awesome. It can seem overwhelmingly broad. We know that God is love, and we know that we'll be known by our love, and we know that there are particular ways we like to show love, and we also know that sometimes we're supposed to show love, but it's a way that's like not convenient, so we don't want to do it, and we're like, God, you can take your love ideas and like go elsewhere. And so sometimes love can be unappealing to show, but it's like awesome to receive. We also know that love changes us from the inside out. And God came to redeem the whole of who we are, not just the part of us that comes to chapel, not the part of us that's in like Bible classes because we're supposed to be, um, not the part of us that like goes to small group and then like sort of forgets small group. Like God redeems and loves the whole of who we are, our personhood. In John 13, 35, Jesus makes it so clear that they will know you are my disciples by the way you love each other. Not just the people we like to love, which is something I like to talk about. In his book, God Has a Dream, Desmond, Bishop Desmond Tutu says this, there's no such thing as a totally hopeless case. Our God is an expert at dealing with chaos with brokenness, with all of the worst that we can imagine. God created order out of disorder, cosmos out of chaos, and God can do so always and can do so now. The most unlikely person, the most improbable situation, these are all transfigurable. They can be turned into their glorious opposites. So indeed, God is transforming the world now through us because God loves us. And I know sometimes it feels like love is for those people who have it together, and I'm like not there. But God comes to transform and redeem all of us. I want to tell you a story of transformation that happened in my life pretty recently in the last few years. So I married a guy named Mike who I did not meet at Gordon. Hey, okay. He's, I married a very proud Florida Gator, um, chomp chomp in the swamp, all right? But listen, if you wanna watch real football, the SEC is where it's at, okay? I'm just saying. Um, but, which that's a whole nother conversation for another day. And if you'd like to have it, my office is on the other side of the balcony wall up there. I have coffee and chocolate. Come visit. Um, seriously. Um, but I married a guy who I met. Okay, so I didn't meet him at Gordon. But true story, I met him doing my Christian ministries practicum for Gordon. All right, so... Listen, it's like I get half credit for that, and I never rang the bell, so I mean, okay. So I married a guy who is a little, um, okay, so if you can't tell, I'm an extrovert. He also is an extrovert, and our life is never boring. And he has ideas, and I like to say no to ideas. And so he keeps pitching ideas, and I'm like, mm, maybe. And then he won me over, and here's what happened. This, hold on, are we there? Are we there? I'm like pressing a button. Meh, you know, whatever. All right, there we go. Hey, that's that guy. That's me and Mike. Ready? That is a school bus from the Monroe Woodbury School District in New York that we bought on eBay, as one does. 
and turned it into our house. Look how excited we are, right? Like, this is like when you come as a freshman in orientation and you're like, this is gonna be amazing. And then life smacks you in the face. Okay, so this is our story of transformation, of one faithful step at a time. So two months before we bought this bus, it was like trucking high school students to and from track meets and baseball games. And in case you're wondering, kids are gross. And so we had to rip out all of these seats and we found like lollipops and stickers and other gross things. And the thing is like we laugh about that but when we talk about transformation and the transformation that happens inside of us, like sometimes we have some pretty gross things too. I'm just saying. <laughs> A moment of self-reflection, please. Okay, no, but not now, because I have things to talk about. So we went from that to this. We ripped out all of the floors, we ripped out the seats, we ripped out the walls, we ripped out the ceiling. Because sometimes to really transform something, you have to get down to the basics. You have to get down to the studs. Now, I will tell you, when my husband won me over to this idea, and I literally was holding our 13 and a half year old pug at the vet when he texted me that we won the eBay auction, it was like, this is amazing, and also sort of like, oh dang, like what did we just do? Now, my husband had a roadmap of how to get there, and I was like, I just want it to look pretty, and right now it does not look pretty. I don't know how to build a house out of a school bus. But you know how you do that? One small step at a time. So, what went from after we ripped out the ceiling, this is what we were installing, and that is four inches wide, and in case you're wondering, our bus house is 38 feet long. It's a lot of ceiling. And uh, those boards are eight feet long, and it took three of us. My dad helped, that's my husband, and I also, like, listen, I just want to make it very clear right now who built this thing, me and my husband. People would be like, how is Mike doing? I'm like, oh, single-handedly with the power tools? Are you kidding me? Who do you think is using the compound miter saw? This girl. Who do you think can't reach to screw things in the ceiling? So I mean, come on, all right? My parents had four girls. I'm the second of four, and they were like, you're a kid, you're a labor force, okay? So I was raised on power tools, and so if, listen, let's just be very clear, all right? So the other thing about this that I love so much is that this transformation took a team. Like, it was always my husband and I, but my parents helped. We had friends who helped. We had friends who helped rip out floor and put in things where Mike's like, so let's talk through electricity. And I was like, if you need me to nod and smile, I'm your girl. If you need actual feedback that will keep you from burning things down, I'm not your girl. And so it took a team of people to walk us through this transformation. I mean, that's kind of cool, right? And then this is what it looked like before we put down flooring. Yeah, I know, it's pretty cool. And um, I made every single one of those cuts, man, let me tell you. A utility knife, like the score and snap, after a while you're like, I'm not snapping and other things, I got blisters. And transformation can be exhausting. That's what it looked like before we ripped out all the school bus windows. I painted that whole sucker myself, let me just tell you. It was me and Jesus, and who kept me from saying some choice words that are not holy. But then we painted it, and the only tool I wasn't willing to use is the angle grinder because it scared the life out of me. Like sparks flying everywhere, and all I could imagine was my hair catching on fire. And listen, that's like not a thing, I'm, it's not a risk I'm willing to take. But when we cut windows, you had one shot. And sometimes, 
in life, when you're taking a step of faith, when you're making a decision, it feels like, oh shoot, I have one chance to get this right. The good news is you get more than one chance because unlike our last window, we cut a little too big and I was having a panic attack and there's a way to fix those things, which is great. And we actually drive our house places. So when I moved here a few weeks ago to take this job, we literally like moved our house. Like my husband drove and I followed in my car with the dog. Um, you get a do-over. This is our painting process. We decided school bus yellow is not our thing. So, hey, all right. And please note, please note, blue and orange, I'm just saying. Think about it. That's how we landed where we are. For those of you who are not connecting the dots, the Florida Gators, blue and orange, chomp chomp. Okay. So, yeah, exactly. If you know, you know. So uh, the inside of our house went from this, which is like, that is where our bathroom is in that little cage and our kitchen's on the other side. And our transformation took us from that to that to, hey, what's up? That's my kitchen. Welcome to my house. The funny thing is, it's the smallest kitchen I've ever had in my life. And my husband and I cook together more than ever before, but it's also like, be careful because I'm chopping things and I don't want to accidentally stab you while you're trying to put something in the trash. But it was a faithful, faithful, next step at a time transformation. You can't put countertops in before you have cabinets. That's our, hey, we got a bedroom. This is more. We needed storage. So my husband's like, hey, we can put in underbody boxes for storage. And I was like, what? You want to cut another hole in this thing? Like how many, like what are we going to do? Again, I did not take part in that part. But it was a process because we needed to store some things. And then we looked at the gaping hole we had created in the side of the bus. Like this better finish well. And sometimes in our transformation journey, we reshape who we are, we reframe, we cut things out, and it's like, I hope this has a good ending, because right now it's not looking great. The good news is, we like mostly know what we're doing, and uh, boom, all right? So that's where like tools and all kinds of fun things live. That was our welcoming steps, which we made pretty. And then we realized, um, hey, we live in the Northeast. You should probably, like, put a rug on that so you don't track the salt in. And then, just for fun, we threw in solar panels because what's up, solar? I mean, it's like free power, okay? And then, so this is it. That's the final project. That's the house that we live in. And it was a lengthy transformation process. And I have to tell you, I've lived in a bunch of different houses in different places, and, like, this is my favorite house. And part of why it's my favorite house is because I know all of the blood, sweat, and tears that went into making it that way. And we have, we have a TV on a televator behind a fireplace inside, so like it hides and goes away, it's pretty cool. And our Apple TV screensaver is a whole album of like 1,400 pictures that we took during the build process. And for us, it's a visible reminder of do you remember when? You get to see tangibly how far you've come. When do we give ourselves those opportunities to see, this is where my transformation has led me. This is where my relationship with Jesus has brought me. This is how far I've come. It's awesome when it's something in your life like where you live, but when it's like your spiritual life, it can be a little harder to quantify if we're not keeping track. So that's enough about my house for now, but I want to chronicle that transformation process because I also want to walk briefly through the life of one of my favorite people in the Bible, Peter. Peter, for me, is relatable. Like, maybe not for you, and that's cool, but Peter, man, what a wild ride. His life is Building, rebuilding, and building again. 
He starts out being recruited by Jesus. He gets invited to be a disciple. And then um, Jesus visits and heals his mother-in-law. Then Peter casts his nest in the ocean and Jesus is like, hey, do this instead. And he gets all kinds of fish. Jesus adds to Peter, well, his name was Simon. He adds the Peter to it, which means rock, which is foreshadowing. Peter witnesses miracles. And then they see Jesus, Peter and the disciples see Jesus walking on the water. And what I love about Peter is I feel like sometimes not a lot happened between having a thought and doing a thing. Like, oh, that's Jesus? I'm on it. Like, I'm just going to go. And then he gets out on the water and is like, oh, maybe this wasn't a great idea. And then he took a swim. And Jesus was like, bro, why'd you take your eyes off me? Like, you had it. Like, you were doing the thing. And then Peter makes a pronouncement. Like, the next thing that we see about Peter in Matthew 16 is that he makes a pronouncement about Jesus being the Son of God. which is incredible. And then shortly after, Jesus tells Peter, like, you are the rock on which I will build my church. And we're like, yeah, Peter. Except if you're Peter, you literally have no idea how the story ends. I feel like sometimes when we read stories in scripture, we read the Bible, we forget that those people were like living life and had no idea what was going to happen. So we're like, yeah, Peter, psh, how could you do that? Like, what were you thinking, dude? Like, get it together. Don't you know the end of this? Oh, you didn't know the end of the story. That's why you, okay, now it all makes a lot more sense. For me, Peter's relatable. So Jesus is like, I'm going to build my church on you. And then Jesus says how he's going to be killed. And Peter's like, that'll never happen to you. Like, not on my watch. And Jesus is like, calm down. So Peter goes from like, I have great faith and I know who God is, to like sassing Jesus. Like, the guy he just said, you are the son of God. Also, I'm going to tell you, you're wrong. Which we, like, make fun of Peter for, but haven't we all done that? Oh, snap. All right. Jesus makes a prediction Peter's going to deny him three times, and Peter's like, not going to do that. Spoiler alert, it happens. And then Peter goes with Jesus and other disciples to the Garden of Gethsemane. And Jesus is like, can you just hold it together? I'm like having a huge crisis. I'm about to, it's about to go down. I literally just need you to stay awake for like one hour while I pray. And they're like, we're on it. We're on it. We're on it. And then Peter's like, <laughs> right? Like five minutes later. We're like, dude, you couldn't be there for like an hour? And then, when Jesus is arrested, Peter whips out his sword and cuts off a servant's ear. Because that's a natural emotional response. Like, we might throw shade at Peter, but like, relatable. Because at that point, how many of you would be like, I'm about to throw hands. Like, you come after my boy, I'm going to throw hands, and it's not going to be pretty. Peter's version of throwing hands is cutting off a dude's ear. I'm just saying. Then they receive, Jesus dies, and their world is crushed. But then Peter receives word from Mary Magdalene because God uses women. And I'm just saying, I have a feeling about that too. And Peter runs to the tomb. He doesn't wait. He just runs to Jesus. Jesus appears to Peter before the other apostles. Jesus gives Peter and the other apostles the gift of the Holy Spirit. And then Jesus, like Peter and others, they're fishing on the Sea of Galilee. 
And they're not having a good time catching fish again because Peter, after Jesus is gone, Peter goes back to what he knows. Also, his wife was probably happy to have him home. But Peter goes back to what he knows. How many of us, when we're in a situation of change or transformation or life happening that we're like, I don't know what to do, but I'm going to do what I know how to do. And sometimes those are not the most helpful things that we do. So Peter is fishing and Jesus, they're like, there's a dude on the shore and it's Jesus. And Peter dives into the water and is like, that's Jesus. Like, I got to get there. Like, if there's nothing true, like the most true thing about Peter is that he wants to be where Jesus is. He wants to be in Jesus's presence. He wants to be changed by Jesus. And so Peter makes a confession of love, and Jesus reinstates him. And Peter, that must have been a super emotional experience, where Jesus is like, yes, do you love me? Feed my sheep. And then right after that, Jesus tells Peter how he's going to die, and Peter's immediate response as he looks to John and is like, but what about that guy? How human is that? To be like, yes, I'm getting this great, awesome thing, but what about them? And Jesus, for all intents and purposes, is like, focus on yourself, bro. How many times do we let our own transformation, our own change, our own becoming in the likeness of Christ, becoming the person God set us to be from the beginning of time, how many times do we let that get derailed by looking to somebody else and wanting their story to be our story? But God doesn't want that for you. He wants your story to be your story, and he wants you to step into that story and be transformed into the likeness of Christ. And sometimes that means showing love in ways that are hard. And sometimes that means being impulsive like Peter and saying, I don't care what it takes. I just want to be with Jesus. This is Peter's story. And then Peter becomes the leader of the remaining disciples. And if we turn to Acts, he is there preaching at Pentecost. Like, the guy who's, like, throwing, like, sassing Jesus is the person at Pentecost where, like, the church is being established. Things are happening. Peter, in Acts 10, shares about Jesus, and it's the first account where the gospel is also clearly for not Jewish people. And then Peter was fighting a different fight because they're like, no, you have to be a Jew to follow Jesus. And there was, like a, there was a lot of arguing, and that's a message for another day. But the point is, Peter was transformational in that process. Peter's the guy who gets busted out of jail by an angel in the middle of the night. Peter took faithful steps forward the whole time. He didn't always get it right. His humanity was like front and center, but so is ours. Peter was full of love that carried him with that message of love to Jews and Gentiles. How are you showing love? What is your next faithful step in showing love? In her book, Sacred Rhythms, Ruth Haley Barton says, For one thing, love is a major inconvenience at times. It is rarely efficient. It is much more complicated than just listing pros and cons and getting on with it. Furthermore, love challenges my self-centeredness. And sometimes it requires me to give more of myself than I want to give. Sometimes love hurts, or at least it makes me vulnerable, and all the time love is risky and there are no guarantees. And boy, do we see that in Peter's life. But I'll tell you one thing, the risk is worth it every single time to show love. With our bus house experience, my husband having it planned out and knowing what each step was, was his way of showing me like, I love you, I've got this. I know this would freak you out, it's okay. 
Ruth Haley Barton also goes on to say, there may be other factors cons to consider, but the deepest question for us as a Christian people is, what does love call for in this situation? What would love do? So you were handed an index card on your way in, and I want you to think about this. Your next faithful step is tangible. Sorry. So this is my water jug that you'll see with me everywhere, so I'm hydrated. And you know how I drink the whole thing? One faithful step at a time. And my very first day here, Bob Woodett was like, you know we actually have water on Gordon's campus. You don't have to bring it all with you in one shot. To which I say, hydration. Let's keep track. I'm just saying. Faithful steps are tangible. So, if we had stopped taking faithful steps in our bus build, I wouldn't have a house. And I will tell you, there were many times where I was ready to throw in the towel or say unholy words. I'm just saying. Peter, if he stopped taking faithful steps, the church would be very different than it is today. So, what is your next faithful step? And I'm not talking a three-year plan, a five-year plan, a one-year plan, a one-month plan. I'm talking, what are you doing before lunch? Steps. Are you asking for prayer because you really need it? Are you going to pray for the person who drives you crazy so they drive you crazy a little bit less? Maybe you're like, you know what, things are really hard and I've been meaning to call the counseling center, but it's like hard to get up the nerve to do that. And maybe that's what your next faithful step is. Maybe you are supposed to learn more than just the names of the people on your floor or the people who sit next to you in class. Maybe you need to call your mom. What's your next faithful step? It could also be seeking a mentor who can encourage your strengths and really speak truth and life into you. We all need those people who are willing to say, I love you so much that I need to speak truth to you in love because you are capable of this and you are limiting yourself to this. Maybe you need to find community, but like actually find community. Like not just say like, but I just want community and it's not magically showing up in my dorm room. Like, it doesn't just magically show up. It involves work. So, like, what is the next step you're going to take? Maybe it's, I need to join a small group. I need to meet people, but I also need to join a small group. Maybe you want to start a small group. Maybe, here's an idea. Maybe your next faithful step is deciding you're actually going to go to church on Sunday morning. Oh, like, I don't know, Okay. So you were handed an index card when you came in, and this is the real talk moment, okay? On that index card, I want you to write what your next faithful step is. If you want to write your name on it, that's cool. You don't have to. This is like a, this is like a what feels right to you situation. But if you want, as we in the chapel office, we are here with you and for you. And so we want to connect you. If you're like, I want to be in a small group. I want to start a small group. I need prayer. Write it down. And we're, we have baskets on the way out. And even if you write down your next faithful step and it's anonymous and you throw it in that basket, you cannot escape the prayer that's going to happen for you. I'm just saying. If you don't know one thing about Tim's son, this is what you need to know. He's the prayer guy. We all pray, but that guy loves a prayer. Loves. We are going to pray for you, but we also want to be here to support you. So please write down your next faithful step and drop it off on the way out. And if you really want tangible support or help, please write your name on it. We'll find you on 360 if we don't know how to get a hold of you. But the thing is, we also need to take a faithful step together as a community in being transformed in love. And this could be that first faithful step. Because God wants to transform and redeem all of us.
Let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you so much for who you are. God, thank you for the example of Peter, Lord, who is an emotional roller coaster and a wild ride, but he's so faithful to you. And he is a picture of love and transformation. And Lord Jesus, we know that you are capable of that same transformation in us. And God, I pray that we would be willing participants in that process. God, make it so clear what our next step is as we follow you. In Jesus' name, amen.